joyous Noel to you all. Hello. Do you like my medieval skin? <laughs> I've got a gown on and then a kirtle. I have a wimple and a veil. There's the back. Very fetching. No woman went out without her head covered. I've decorated the inner bailey with some of our modern trappings of Christmas, but without the plastic commercialism. But would someone from the 12th century recognise these as part of the Christmas festival? Let's find out. And excuse me for being back and forth to plowing and planting fields while I talk. There is still so much to be done. And by the way, I could make a whole episode on every single bit that I'm talking about. So excuse the fact that this is brief. It wasn't originally a date for Christmas and there's debate as to who made it the 25th of December and when. Was it Pope Julius I in about 350? Was it an attempt by the church to hijack Sol Invictus? Was it chosen because it was exactly nine months from the spring equinox, traditionally seen as the time of the incarnation? Or to co-opt midwinter celebrations as the 25th of December was the date of the winter solstice in the Julian calendar? Your guess is as good as mine. At any rate, there is no record of it being celebrated until around the fourth century. So let's look at the timings of Christmas in medieval Europe and Britain. Christmas actually started 40 days before the 25th of December with Advent, the Christmas equivalent of Lent. From the 11th of November through to Christmas Eve, people were supposed to abstain from eating meat and other animal products, from drinking alcohol and from other activities and merrymaking. It was a time for contemplation and prayer. It was also a handy way to make sure supplies lasted as winter bit hard. Once Christmas Day came, everything was back on the menu. Christmas celebrations lasted for 12 days, ending on the 6th of January with Epiphany, or the Visitation of the Wise Men, and was also called Twelfth Night. The octave of Epiphany, the 13th of January, was also marked in the liturgy. Let's get back up to the castle. I've got a sign saying Merry Christmas. That's going. They didn't say that. And it's not some stupid war on Christmas thing. Instead, medieval people said Noel. It came from the Latin Natalis, meaning birth, and puts the focus on the point of the festival. A Christmas tree. Maybe? Like this? No. Let's remove all the candles. If you have tinsel or garlands or baubles, get rid of them too. There was the decidedly pagan practice of the Yule log to burn through the winter solstice and into the new year. But there was also in some places a practice of erecting evergreen trees. Outdoors only, and only in colder areas, certainly not indoors. And a lot of people didn't even do the outdoors one. And there are only sporadic references to that from the late Middle Ages. So let's get rid of it. Which brings us to gifts. Nope, get rid of them all. Gifts weren't given on Christmas Day, they were exchanged at New Year's instead. And they would not have been wrapped in paper. If they were wrapped, it would have been in cloth, which is more sustainable, so let's bring that back. The church alternated between gift giving is pagan, don't do it, and gift giving is fine, go ahead. In the end, they basically gave up what was always going to be a losing battle and said, the wise men did it, so can you. By the way, those gifts, they're death gifts. Frankincense and myrrh are for perfuming and embalming a dead body. And the gold is to pay for a burial plot. Great gift for a newborn. As to music, stop the music. Well, stop that music anyway. Liturgical music was fine, in Latin, in church, and there was lots of it and it was beautiful. There's a link to one in the description. But no to carols. A carol was a circle dance with an accompanying song and was often quite lewd. Carols were banned in church. Remember, no pews, everyone stands. The last thing the priest wants is for someone to start caroling and people joining in and suddenly everyone's being jostled and the words and dance are probably quite rude anyway. So do it outdoors or in a hall, but not in here. It wasn't until the 13th century that carols specifically for Christmas began to appear. One of the earliest of these is Noel, Noel, Teardings True. And a link for that again is in the description. As to church, 
Like Easter, there were three masses performed which ordinary people were expected to attend. And masses could go for two hours. The extra devout could always stay longer and do the full course, which the priests were expected to do. But for everyone else, it ran like this. Midnight mass, because Jesus was supposed to have been born bang on the stroke of midnight. Then you come back for louds, which was dawn. And yes, in winter, that could be quite late. And then again at midday for sext, the sixth hour of the day. And make sure you are sober. Which brings us to the Christmas feast. I know I said no gifts, but food, that was a different matter. The peasants were expected to give food to the Lord and probably to any large church institutions that controlled their life. You want permission to keep and breed rabbits? You'd better give a rabbit to the local abbot or he'll revoke that permission. Your Lord? A chicken, some grain, maybe some other choice bit of produce. In return, there was a requirement for the Lord to provide you and your family with a meal on the day, and it was expected to include a meat dish. For people who lived on a largely vegetarian diet year round, this was a big deal. What was provided varied from Lord to Lord, place to place. It might be bread and a mess of beef and bacon. It might be bread and some other meat dish. What does seem to be standard in England, at least, is as much beer and ale as could be drunk on the day. Yes, it was lower in alcohol, but it wasn't alcohol free. And everyone has just gone through a 40 day abstinence for Advent. The rich could be dining for their Christmas feast on anything. Peacock, venison, goose, a boar, and the boar's head really was a feature of feast, and all manner of spiced dishes. Rich food for rich folk. What you wouldn't see is turkey, potatoes, maize, pumpkin, tomatoes, any of those foods from the Americas. You're a few hundred years away from those. The following day, 26 December or Boxing Day, was in medieval times the Feast of St Stephen. Remember good King Wenceslas went out on the Feast of Stephen? He found a poor man and gave him food and shelter. The Feast of St Stephen was focused on caring for the poor and providing them with a meal. I imagine it involved a lot of leftovers from Christmas Day. And now for something decidedly pagan that has survived for an extremely long time. Right back to the ancient Greeks. Mistletoe. It's not clear exactly where this came from or what it was for in celebrations. We know some hung it for luck, others for fertility, others to ward off evil. Did it require a kiss or not? Was it symbolic of Frigg's joy over the resurrection of her son Balder? What we do know is that it was not used the way it is now. Any woman standing under the mistletoe was not duty bound to be kissed. That's a Victorian thing and probably thought up by some man with halitosis and no respect for women. I'm not getting into the Druids and mistletoe as most of our information there comes from Pliny the Elder who is not a reliable source. But the plant does have documented associations with fertility and it grows throughout winter so it's understandable that people hung it up either on its own or in a ball with other evergreen plants. The church repeatedly attempted to ban it, but to no avail. Mistletoe continued to be hung above doorways. And by the way, I mean this. Viscum album, native to Europe. Not this, Phoradendrum leucarpum, which is native to North America. So that's it. No tree, no gifts, at least not on the day, but still within Christmas tide. But plenty of music and feasting and definitely mistletoe. Noel, everyone.